thanks for being here. And I am indeed going to talk to you today about Mickey Spillane's Miami and more. I've talked about Mickey Spillane before. I gave a talk on him last year as a general session. That's up on YouTube. I put a link to it on the back of your handout. And what I'm going to be talking about today is I will tell you something about other things I know about Mickey Spillane and what Mickey Spillane himself had to say in his writing about Miami. Okay, and I am going to have questions at the end, and I'm here all week, so if you have questions that you don't have time to ask today, you can ask me later. So thank you for being here. I guess it was kind of a journey here from the Ukraine, and I'm not going to take you on a further journey because right now we're going to go back in time to the 1950s, and we're going to go to an apartment in the Bronx. Okay? All right. And I'm going to be reading this, this part. It's a fellow named Joe. There were these men in their 30s, okay? And Joe says, so the whole book winds up. Mike Hammer, he's in a room there with this doll. So he says, you rat, you are the murderer. So she begins to con him, you know? She tells him how she loves him. And then, bam, he shoots her in the stomach. So she's laying there, gasping for breath. And she says, how could you do that? And he says, it was easy. All right, and then the, the, the guy's friend says, boy, that Mickey Spillane, boy, he sure can write. And then Joe picks up the theme again. What I like about Mickey Spillane is he knows how to handle women. In one book, he picks up a tomato. Oh, just translation, a tomato in Mickey Spillane does not actually mean a vegetable, okay? It's another name for a woman. And, all right, picks up a tomato. She's been hit with a car. She throws a pass at him. He meets two beautiful twins. They throw passes at him. Then he meets a beautiful society dame, and she throws a pass at him. And then his friend says, boy, that Mickey Spillane, he sure can write. And then there's more conversation, and Joe picks up the theme again. Another book that I read by Mickey Spillane, I can't remember the name of it. He finds this redheaded tramp in a street, and he gives her some dough because he feels sorry for her. Wait a minute. I think that's the same book I was telling you about before. Well, if you know his books, it isn't, but you get some idea of what this particular reader is like. Now, the movie in which this conversation takes place, it was a television show first and then a movie, and it was praised by Ayn Rand as follows, quote, an extremely sensitive, perceptive, touching portrayal of a humble man's struggle for self-assertion, unquote. So what's this movie or television show? Marty. Yay, it's Marty, okay. It's Marty, it was a 1955 movie and it was based on a 1953 teleplay by Patty Chayefsky. And Marty is the primary character. He's the humble man struggling for self-assertion. And these two men, the, the literary critics who are talking about Mickey Spillane, uh, they're not primary characters. And from the standpoint of the movie, they actually represent the wrong way to treat a woman. So I think, of course, that they were also wrong about Mickey Spillane, as if he's just writing the same book, one after another. And if you read the three books that are mentioned, they actually are three different books, because the third one mentioned is My Gun is Quick, and it's not the same as the second one, which is Kiss Me Deadly, much less the first one, which is the first novel by Mickey Spillane. I think it's fair to say that Ayn Rand, and we're all here because of Ayn Rand, did not endorse the point of view of these two men in the Bronx talking about Mickey Spillane, but she did agree with what one of them said, boy, he sure can write. Now, I'm going to be talking today, we're here in Miami, Florida, about Mickey Spillane's Miami and more. Um, by more, I mean I'll be sharing not just what he had to say about Miami, but more things that... I've learned about Mickey Spillane and more than I was able to talk about last year. And uh, there's been a new biography, there's new information, and so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Mickey Spillane in general, then I'll talk about his Miami, and then I'll tell you some of the more things I've learned about him. Okay, what are the things that I mentioned last year, which I think, in case you're sitting there wondering who is or was Mickey Spillane. He's one of the best-selling authors of all time with estimated sales of 225 million books. That's a lot of books, right? And in 1960, his books were seven of the top 
10 best-selling books of the 20th century. A hostile critic asked him, how do you feel about that, that you know, you've written seven of the 10 best-selling books of the 20th century, and he said, you'd better be glad I've written only seven books. <laughs> okay. And um, he, he did write more than seven books. I think it, it, th those seven did end up being the bestsellers. I think they were seven of the 15 bestsellers, you know, 10, 20 years later. Ayn Rand's admiration for Mickey Spillane, of course, she approved of the fact that he was uh, proud of his ability and proud of his sales, but she thought of him as someone who believed in moral absolutes, himself and his character. She thought that his protagonist, Mike Hammer, who was the hero of those early books, was indeed a genuine hero, and what she said about his style, she said that it appealed to a rational psychoepistemology. Mickey was interested in that fact. That was something that no one had ever quite said to him before. They actually did become friends, and I think that he understood what she meant by it. Now, last year I talked about the, uh, their first personal meeting. I talked about their friendship. I talked about the conversation the first time they met that lasted four hours and that their interchange continued for years. I talked about the fact that she wrote about him in public, you know, in, and in, in, uh, in print, and she spoke about him, and that uh, she, wrote, she talked about him in her fiction writing course. He's in the Romantic Manifesto. He's in the column she wrote for the Los Angeles Times. Okay, today what I'm gonna do is to talk about information that isn't in effect the same book that I told you about last year, the same stuff I told you about last year. But I think it's pertinent, and he's always, in certain ways, has some of the good qualities that she admired in him. Okay, so we're gonna sort of start with the Miami. Mike Hammer is the character he's known for. Mike Hammer is the hero of most of the early books. Mike Hammer is identified with New York City. His office is in New York. His home is in New York. His ally is the chief of police, Pat Chambers, one of New York's finest. My camera eats at the Blue Ribbon, and that was a real restaurant, by the way, and he and Ayn Rand, you know, uh, he invited her to have dinner with him there as well. On lonely nights, my camera walks the streets of New York, and he even hangs out with High Gardner, who was the Broadway columnist for the New York Herald Tribune. Now, Mike wasn't tethered to New York, and Mickey Spillane wasn't tethered to New York, and you'll hear more about that in a minute. But for the most part, Mike Hammer, the character after his time in the military, spent most of his time in New York. But Mickey Spillane, even though he was born in New York, spent time in New York, was not a lifelong New Yorker. Regarding New York, he wrote to Ayn Rand on February 24th, 1967, he said, this past January, I took an apartment at 225 East 57th Street to use as an office apartment pending a Broadway musical we're putting out, he and his wife. My wife inhabits the place while she works on her new club act, does her shows, while I commute. I had my belly full of New York the day after I was born there, but business drives me back too often. When I get in again, I'll buzz you and see if we can make it at the Blue Ribbon. Meanwhile, get Atlas Shrugging again, will you? Love, Mickey Spillane. So he knew New York, he'd been in New York, he didn't want to be a lifelong New Yorker, nor did he want to be a writer who could only write about one character or one place. He wrote novels and stories with heroes other than Mike Hammer. Although they had in common with Mike Hammer moral and physical courage and being the guardians of the good and the worst nightmare of the evil. So, if you follow along with uh, Mickey Spillane, you'll see that he created Johnny McBride, who's a vet in The Long Wait, Lieutenant Joe Scanlon in Killer Mine, Dog Run Kelly in The Erection Set, Mako Hooker, same initials, right, a fishing boat captain in Something's Down There, Gil Burke, an ex-cop in The Last Cop Out. All of them have a commitment to justice and more than a casual interest in revenge. I'll be saying more about revenge later. They aren't exactly the same as my camera. Also, as I mentioned last time, and I thought this was really interesting, um, Mickey Splane created a Western character, Caleb York. He was um, planning a screen treatment, possibly to be enacted by his friend, John Wayne. And this guy, is, you know, Caleb York is initially 
You might say the man with no name. He's a gunslinger who rides into town, and the next thing you know, he's drawing his gun. He's protecting the innocent. He's cleaning up the town. He's becoming sheriff. In a sense, you could say that he's Mike Hammer on a horse with a sheriff's badge, but he's, he's his own man in style and setting and background and story. Because really, Mickey Spillane did not want to just keep writing the same book over and over again. In fact, even though he was best known for Mike Hammer, he resisted when his publisher tried to make him change Mako Hooker for something's down there to Mike Hammer, and he says, no, I'm not going to do that. And so they said, okay, well, we're not going to publish that. So he went to Simon and & Schuster, and they published it. You know, that, well, of course, you know, he had plenty of opportunities to publish many things, but he really wanted to be writing about Mike Hammer-like characters, but not just the same one every time. And uh, I'm going to tell you now about Morgan the Raider. I put on the handout the nice quotation about Miami. You know, can you believe people with their own bare hands built this? But I find Morgan the Raider and the books in which he appeared as a good featuring on Mickey's part of Miami. OK, now, here's what happened with the Morgan the Raider books. In the letter I just read you that he wrote to Ayn Rand in 1967, he told her he'd just given the book The Delta Factor to Dutton, who was his hardcover publisher, and, quote, everybody liked it so much that they wanted the sequel immediately, so I went to work on the consummata and about to ship them it and then loaf in the sun for a few days, unquote. In other words, he went to work on a sequel to the first Morgan book, which is Delta Factor, and the Morgan books are the ones that take us especially to Miami. So first I'm going to tell you about The Delta Factor, which was published in 67. This story, anyone read The Delta Factor? I think I see a hand. Well, maybe, maybe after I tell you about it, you'll want to read it and the sequel. OK, the, the, the main character is Morgan the Raider, the mysterious Morgan, just Morgan, no first name. But it's an allusion to the 17th century pirate, Sir Henry Morgan. And it's a first person novel. And the character basically tells us what we need to know to follow the story, but he doesn't do a lot by way of introspection or backward glances or spilling the beans. He is said to be a professional thief. He's said to be the one responsible for stealing $40 million from a shipment of currency from the Washington unit to New York. He is caught with cash in his New York City boarding house. He's locked up until he escapes. And then he's on the run until he's hit by a car. That stops him, and he wakes up in the hospital. And that's when they catch up with him again. Uh, there's a police officer by his bedside talking to the doctor. And this is what the police officer says about Morgan. Quote, this man is dangerous. He isn't like an ordinary hood with behavior patterns we're used to. We could deal with that. He's not part of any antisocial group our people could classify and work against. His type comes out of another era entirely, unquote. So, you know, Nikki Splane's describing him as being adventurous, romantic, almost a person out of time. Now, in the story, he wakes up, the police are there, and they're very interested in what happened to the $40 million, and they're interested in using him and his, shall we say, special skills. And he's given a choice. Either he's going to go back to prison. Now, of course, he might be able to escape from prison, but going to go back to prison. Or he can go to a different prison, the Rose Castle, where there's a scientist in hiding, and he can break that scientist out of prison. It's on the island of Nuevo Cadiz because they need the scientist. It's a joint FBI-CIA operation. The scientist's research has military implications. So what he's supposed to do is either confirm the scientist's death, in other words, kill him or make sure that he's dead, or bring him home. And this Rose Castle is, again, something out of another period, another time, another place. Here's how it's described. A granite fortress built by the Spaniards in 1620, dedicated to death and destruction, and used as a prison for political prisoners, with a reputation, this is the prison itself, of being absolutely impregnable and totally escape-proof. The Spaniards hadn't fooled around with modern conceptions of humane treatment for its inhabitants. So you, you can imagine the scientist is going to be pretty glad to get out of there and that it's not going to be an easy task. Well, Morgan 
Given the choice between going to the Rose Castle to rescue the scientist, which seems to be a good goal, or going back to prison, he says, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And of course, he probably, well, even he sort of hints to us that he's not going back to prison anyway. You know, no matter how this works out, he is going to be at liberty. But there's a little complication. He's assigned a partner, a CIA agent. Her name is Kimberly Stacy, And he's given a bank account in the name of M.A. Winters. And he and Kimberly Stacy marry legally in Georgia. They cross the line into Florida. They drive to Miami. They meet up with an old war buddy of Morgan, and they set off for the island where the scientist is being held, and they're posing as husband and wife on a honeymoon. Well, the truth, of course, is that Morgan is not actually a bad guy. He hasn't stolen the 40 million. He's unconventional, but he's not a crook. He's not immoral. He's clever. He's capable. And he certainly does not intend to go back to prison. He does manage to achieve the, uh, the rescue of the scientist, and it's not easy. And as far as the relationship with the agent, Kim Stacy, who is posing as his wife and who is legally his wife, but is not planning to remain his wife, she says this is just for the job. Well, if you've seen Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert and it happened one night, maybe you can figure out how this worked out. Okay, you know, so they become, they become fond of each other, of each other, and at the end, after he's cleared himself in the eyes of his wife, after they've rescued the scientist, after they've escaped not only from local political assassins from the island and from a hurricane, their story concludes, in effect, with a rain check to be continued. So what does this have to do with Miami? Well, this prison is not on Miami, but in Miami. But Miami kind of stands as the real world from which we take off for the adventure, okay? The novel mentions Miami 18 times, and the city is featured as standing for the real world, okay? The real world, and then we take off for the adventure. It's the place we leave for the rescuing of the scientist and the place where we're headed at the end. And then, of course, something happens that he doesn't exactly get back there as the feds think he's going to. Now, here's what happened. Uh, the novel itself was pretty successful. Uh, Anthony Boucher, who was a detective fiction writer and critic who had little good to say about Mickey Spillane's novels in general, he liked this one. And he liked Morgan, and he said that Morgan was Spillane's best creation to date. The book sold pretty well. And then it was turned into a movie. And you know, that's a problem, right? If you've got a character and the character is portrayed in a movie and the movie is a problem, it can make it difficult to continue that character's story right away until people forget about the movie. Okay, now the movie had some promise. Um, there was a decent cast. Uh, Yvette Mimieux was in it, and Sherry Spillane, who was Mickey Spillane's wife at the time, was in it. And uh, the character, the Morgan character, was played by Christopher George whom you may know is co-starring with Hans Gudegast in Rat Patrol. And the producer was Robert Fellows, who had produced the film of The Girl Hunters, starring Mickey himself as Mike Hammer. And Bob Fellows, you know, had, had the, the rights to do it, and he wanted to do a good job, but he had a heart attack and became ill, died, um, didn't finish the job, and the movie, if you see it, you, you can see that it had promise, but it didn't work out very well. It was delayed in its release, and it was not a financial or critical success. So it looks as if that's the reason that even though Mickey Splane had finished the next book, Dutton didn't want to publish it right away. And time went by, and Mickey Splane sometimes, you know, he didn't like nagging people, knocking on their door, and saying, won't you publish my books, because... Well, he had other books that he wanted to publish, and he didn't want to beg. And so he had the, you know, the sequel was pretty much done, but there was a delay. And in fact, it didn't get published until after Mickey's death. Uh, the manuscript of this and other books were given to Max Allen Collins, who was the literary executor and who has over time been finishing up the manuscripts. Apparently what Mickey said um, to his wife, at that time, Jane, he said, after I'm gone, there's going to be a treasure hunt around here. Anything you find, give it to Max. He'll know what to do. 
And ever since 2006, Max has been knowing what to do, and this is one of the books he came up with. And, in, and when you read it, you read the consummata, you find out what happened to the missing money, you find out how things worked out for Morgan and Kim Stacy. And the first book, you could say, if you read it, ends literally and figuratively in the air, but the second one explains what, on solid ground what we need to know. And it's set in Miami. It's set in Miami of the time period of the Delta Factor, the late 60s. And it answers our questions. It tells us who really took the $40 million and where is it now? It tells us what any of this has to do with that other Morgan, Sir Henry Morgan, for whom Morgan the Raider is named. And it takes us, we spent a lot of time in Little Havana, where Morgan is hiding out from all the people who are trying to catch him, the bad guys and the federal agents. And he's described as being, quote, a man with a price on his head and the police at his back, unquote. But he is revered by the people he deals with personally as a hero. And he meets with agents, he meets with revolutionaries, he meets with double agents, he meets with triple agents. He spends time all over Miami in hotels, at least until one of the hotels he stays in has a bomb. You know, and then he, he moves, after, he's, he, he uh, changes residence after that. He spends time on the seedier side of the, of the city. And basically, Mickey Spillane describes it all. And I'm going to read you a little one, read you one description. In its day, the hillside had been one of the better apartment buildings, not one of those pink stucco art modern jobs that looked so spiffy in the 30s, but now were faded, pockmarked, and crumbly. A few facelifts hadn't helped much, and now the hillside just stood there among others of its ilk, like Mickey Spillane, aging old broads gathered to talk about what used to be and what might have been. And he has other descriptions of, of the neighborhood. Um, he talks about Little Havana. It, had lo it lacked some of the robust flavor it used to have, but there were enough coffee shops, even at night, that uh, added even more spice to the rhythmic, rhythmic sounds of Latin music pulsing behind barroom windows. And he describes you know, moving around there, hiding, all sorts of places to hide, knocking on doors, people sheltering him from, from danger. I think it's a fun book, okay? I, I actually en enjoyed both of them. I wouldn't have minded, would have been happy if he'd done a third one. I think that what happened is Mickey wrote the sequel and then he, not Mickey, yeah, Mickey Spillane, I shouldn't call him Mickey, I don't, not really on first term basis with him, but he, he wrote the sequel and then when that didn't get published, he didn't write a third one to go along with. Now, I'm going to get back to the Morgan books later when I talk about the writers Spillane admired. But now I want to tell you about other Miami uh, Mickey Spillane books. And it's the Josh and Larry series, the young adult books he wrote. OK, he started the series on a bet. And Max Allen Collins explains, it came about when an editor responding to Mickey's claim that a professional writer should be able to write anything, dared him to write a kid's book. The provocateur was not aware that the writer often responded to such challenges as when he bet one editor that he could withhold the solution to a mystery until the last word, that's vengeance is mine, and another that he could put in a blatant error the editor could not spot. And that was when he put uh, the, the toll to a bridge on the wrong side of the street. Okay, Mickey won a bet both times. Whether the editor who inspired the writing of the Josh and Larry series was involved in a money bet, we don't know. But we do know that Mickey Spillane won because the publicity for Mickey Spillane with his reputation writing a kid's book, that was useful for him forever. Now, people asked him, you know, why did you do it? And what he said one time, he said, well, why do, I, why do you write books for kids? He says, well, they do grow up to be adults, you know? Okay, meaning that he hooks them with the interest in the stories. But I think, in fact, what he liked doing with the Josh and Larry stories was uh, dealing with exotic adventures in interesting places. And again, it was another way to get out of New York. Exciting, exciting conflicts in exotic places, life and death on the line, doing something new. 
And what he said he did when he wrote these books, he said that he tried to adopt the viewpoint of a child. But you know, an inquisitive child, an adventurous child, a child who reads the story for the pleasure of finding out what's going to happen next. OK, first one's called uh, The Day the Sea Rolled Back. The second one was The Ship That Never Was. And they were both published during Splain's lifetime. And the first one was awarded a Junior Literary Guild Prize. Imagine they got good publicity out of that. And the third one, called The Shrieking Island, was published with the other two together. Um, you know, he'd, he'd finished it. And then um, after he was gone, Max put all three of them together. It's, uh, it's set in the Caribbean. It involves this, uh, the three of them about the search for sunken treasure, the rescue of a sailor, discovery of a lost island, daring, danger, treasure. There's a point at which there are, notori there are two really bad adults trying to harm the two boys. But I think that you have the sense that the, the boys are going to be all right, that there's a book for kids. Mickey Splane's not going to kill off the kids. But you know, there are these two dangerous men against the kids. They've got to be resourceful. And there is also a shark involved. But things, things do work out, although not easily. It's ex I think it's exciting. So what's the picture of Miami? OK. The main characters live on uh, Peel Island. And Miami is the place that stands as culture. That's where they go for a museum, for a language institute, for a library with old books and manuscripts, for a bank loan. It's culture, it's knowledge, it's even finance. And that's where the line comes in that I quoted for you. Josh, who's someone who's never been to Miami, first sees Miami. And this is, this is the way it's described. The fantastic white skyline of that great Florida beach had made Josh go speechless when he saw it from the air. And now, strolling among the enormous hotels and beautiful homes made him shake his head in wonder. Larry, he said, it's hard to believe. How could men with their bare hands build such a place? And Larry says, they had mighty big tools, Josh. He pointed to a crane on the roof of a partially completed building, like that one. Josh could hardly believe his eyes. How did they get that up there? OK, so it's a very positive picture. You know, the, the, this, is a, this is a place where, you know, basic, we're used to cranes. We're used to buildings. But that, uh, you know, he's got the kid's view of wonder that that's an exciting thing, that they could build such a place. OK, so that's, so we got the Morgan books. We've got the Josh and Larry books. And then there's this other Miami book. Um, it's called The Last Cop Out, which Ayn Rand did not like, and which I don't like either. Um, she mentioned that Mickey Splane had descend, quote, descended to the fully modern, unquote. Well, I'll tell you simply that in it, there's a former police officer who was framed by the mob, and he's seeking for the root of the corruption and the trail leads to Miami. But we don't actually spend that much time in doing anything interesting in Miami. We're sort of in, in the vicinity. So that's the last cop out. That's another Miami book. But um, I mean, as I said, Ayn Rand owned it. She didn't like it. I don't particularly like it either. But there's one more. And this is the Mike Hammer book that Ayn Rand didn't have a chance to read. And before I tell you about it, I have to tell you about something else that I learned over the past year. Because this is a question that many readers have had for more than half a century. What happened to Mickey Spillane during what has been called the long wait, to borrow the title of one of his books? The long wait has been an unsolved mystery. And here's the way that Max describes it. The biggest mystery has been why Spillane did not write a Mike Hammer novel or even a Hammer short story for the 10 years that separated Kiss Me Deadly, 52, and The Girl Hunters, 62. After all, Spillane was not just the most internationally popular mystery writer of the 50s and early 60s. He was the best-selling author in America, period. Okay, much speculation, I'm still reading from Max, has been bandied about to explain the long wait. Mickey was suffering from writer's block, or he had too much money coming in from radio and comic strips and movies to bother, or his religious conversion, 
to the conservative Jehovah's Witnesses made him swear off his sex and violence style. Or he was too caught up in pursuits like deep sea treasure hunting, hot rod racing, which he did do these things, touring with the Clyde Beatty Circus, and skydiving. While each of those holds a grain of truth, the real reason turned up in research for the biography that Max Allen Collins wrote with James L. Trailer, Spillane, King of Pulp Fiction. And that new biography finally came out in February of this year, so now we know. And by the way, I do recommend it to you. Um, I will com comment, because it's true, that there's a, little sh there's a short chapter on Ayn Rand and Mickey Spillane in there, mostly right, and that I, am, I did not help with that part in particular. I didn't you know, fact check it, but I am acknowledged in the book. And I think that it gives you a lot of information that has not been previously available and information that was available, but that he presented, I think, in a good way. And here's his explanation. In some ways, it's kind of mundane, but it makes sense that Spillane had made a contract with Victor Saville about films. In 1952, Victor Saville, filmmaker, announced that he had an exclusive contract with Spillane and planned to make two pictures a year, and that Mike Hammer and Mickey Spillane in general were tied up by the option clause in this contract. So he apparently, Mickey Spillane couldn't control his own work because this was a contract that, you know, gave him, in a sense, uh, outlets for turning in his work into movies, but he didn't like the way that Saville was making the movies, and if he didn't do, if he did new work, then Saville would be able to get his hands on it. Someone, he probably should have thought better before he signed that. Well, that looks as if that's probably the reason. You know, not the Jehovah's Witnesses, and not, not liking bad reviews, not being on strike, but the contract with Saville. This gave him a limited ability to do his own work in his own way, and so he did other things. However, while he was not publishing the books, not publishing my camera stories, he did keep working with the mystery, the unsolved uh, situation that he had created at the end of Kiss Me Deadly. Okay. And Kiss Me Deadly, um, he was working up to the disappearance, the mysterious disappearance of Velda, which it then, he then, Mickey Spillane, makes three attempts to solve, to explain. The third one is the one we know. That's the Girl Hunters. He published that. That was the return of Mickey Spillane, the return of Mike Hammer, after years of drinking and despair on the part of Mike Hammer, not Mickey, after the disappearance of Velda, his partner or assistant. And this is the novel that you probably remember that Ayn Rand read and praised. She praised it in a column for the Los Angeles Times, and the column was reprinted in the Objectivist Newsletter, and it's also in that, the book, the Ayn Rand column, which was edited by Peter Schwartz. And I'll read you a little bit of that. One expects the unexpected from Mickey Spillane, and one gets it. The story opens with Mike Hammer as a drunken bum who's gone to pieces under the pressure of self-reproach for a tragic disaster. What caused it and what brings him back, you will have to find out for yourself. And I'm still quoting. Though beautifully written and extremely dramatic, Mike Hammer, in this book, is a bum. And it's simply out of character. And here's one admirer of Mike's who objects to it. But fortunately, his recovery is fairly speedy. It's also somewhat out of character for Mickey Spillane to keep reminding Mike that he's not what he used to be. Because, Iron Man says, he is. Both of them are. The old vitality, the energy, the pace, the excitement come breaking through almost in spite of the author's intention. I almost wish Mike would tell Mickey that it would take a much worse man than he, Mickey, is to keep my camera down. And I sort of love that, you know, sort of as if Ayn Rand's putting herself in the universe of the book, as if um, my camera can talk back to Mickey Spillane. Anyway, that book, The Girl Hunters, was Spillane's formal and canonical attempt, that's the one that's published, to tell his readers what happened to Mickey after Velda disappeared. But there were at least two false starts. And one of them was a script that Spillane worked on, never produced, and you can read in the book Kill Me If You Can, which was published just last year by Max Allen Collins. He finished 
That story, Mike's attempt to seek clarity and revenge. But there's this other false start, and this one goes to Miami. So this is actually my camera in Miami. And this one also was completed by Max and under the title, Kill Me Darling. And this concerns my camera on the trail of Velda. She's disappeared without telling him where she was headed or why. And Mar Ward Manley, who was a New York police officer with whom she had worked in Vice before she worked with and knew my camera, he's been killed. And somehow Velda's disappearance is connected with that, except that we don't know why she is in Miami and connected with a major gangster there. You know, could it be? What do you think? Yeah, all right. Nonetheless, you know, in the, in, in the moment, it looks as if she's hanging out with this Nolly Quinn, a drug racketeer. And of course, my camera has to go down there, first of all, to find out uh, what happened to Velda and, of course, to also solve the problem of what happened to Ward Manley. So I'm gonna read you some of this with the understanding that um, Max was working with a fragment. This is one for which there was not a full novel written, but I think that uh, parts of it, and I, I think the parts that I'm, I'm gonna read to you sound to me as if they're, they're Mickey Spillane. Okay, we are told that um, Miami is suffering from, I'm not, I'm summarizing now, criminal activities that infect and infest a variety of businesses. And here's what the city editor says. Miami attracts money and that's where the wolves gather. We're a playground for top gangsters and maybe it's our own fault for letting them worm themselves in so far that they can't be shaken loose. And in the novel, Miami, this, the city, is contrasted with Miami Beach, the playground. Okay, here's the city. By 1 a.m., the life had left the city and the skeleton of it made a drowsy hum on the breeze that came in from the water. The streets were empty except for the occasional, occasional taxi or lost tourist. And the smell of the exhaust from the air conditioning units hanging heavily out of apartment windows laid a blanket of hothouse smells down the sidewalks. Across Biscayne Bay, Miami Beach would be alive and hopping for off season anyway, not Miami, not by a long shot. It was almost 3 a.m. when I got back to the motel. All the lights were out, even the neon sign off. The only illumination came from a hunk of moon and some stars spilled around up there, and the only sounds were the insistent lapping of waves and a breeze rustling through fronds. The night was warm but not hot, humid but not dank, a little sweaty and a lot sultry, like a belly dancer on her last set. Okay, now I don't have a lot of experience with uh, viewing belly dancers on their last set, but presumably my camera knew what that looked like. Okay, and he describes, you know, uh, well, I'll, I'll just give you this bit in which he comments on, um, on Miami Beach. He says, how could a place with no manufacturing, no commerce, no slums, no railroad, no airport call itself a city? Mostly it was five miles of oceanfront hotels, ritzy night spots, and swanky shops all catering to the wealthy who flocked there in winter. And there's more, you know, but that's, you know, the, the whole thing takes place uh, there, and he's got descriptions, and, you know, uh, he pictures what it looks like, what it sounds like, what it smells like. That's the Miami Mike Hammer. So we got a whole collection here, right? We got Morgan the Raider in Miami. We got Josh and Larry in Miami. We've got, in the last cop out, which I don't like, we've got the police officer Burke in Miami and Mike Hammer in Miami. A decent cast of Miami Mickey Spillane characters. And now I want to tell you a little more about Morgan, Morgan the Raider. Okay, this brings me over to my more part of the talk, which is uh, Mickey Spillane as reader or Mickey Spillane in relation to other writers. And I'm going to start with Alexandre Dumas and Mickey Spillane. Mickey said, Mickey Spillane said that Alexandre Dumas, as an author, was his biggest literary inspiration. And he said that The Three Musketeers was his biggest literary inspiration as a book. Okay, so Dumas in general and that book in particular. 
the, and I think we can see it, we can see that the adventure and the drive and the action and the plot twists and the alliances among comrades and the fate of a treacherous woman, Milady to Winters in, um, in The Three Musketeers, these things are very, very Mickey Spillane. And the prison rescue in the Rose Castle and the Delta Factor with Morgan the Raider is very, very Alexandre Dumas. Now, um, Max's co-biographer commented that one of the things that really interested him in getting to know Mickey was that Mickey loved the classics. And he knew him, so he can first name him. I remember well Mickey telling me about writing the classics illustrated comic of the Count of Monte Cristo. His comic book version even reads like a Mike Hammer adventure. I had no idea that as a youth he read Alexandre Dumas. Mickey loved words and the craft of writing. Well, if you've kind of seen me around, you know that I, I, I read something like this and ooh, you know, there, there I am over up online trying to order the next work of scholarship. So I paid pretty good money for a copy of a 1940s Classics Illustrated comic, which is uh, written by Mickey Spillane, and I, I, it didn't say Mickey Spillane, but I, I could see it. I could see the themes of justice and revenge and action. Uh, there was a streamlined story, and there's a morally strong hero. As a matter of fact, he makes the hero in, uh, you know, stronger, because in The Count of Monte Cristo, there is, well, one of the things that the, the Count does is that he concocts a situation in which the son of an enemy is in danger, and then he rescues him. Well, in Mickey Spillane's version, the, the young man really was in danger, and he rescued him. So, you know, essentially he cleaned up the hero, and I think that's fine, you know. I mean, it's, you don't ordinarily expect a 48-page Classics Illustrated comic to be the exact same thing as the very, very long novel. And the clever, vicious female villain, she was not cleaned up. She was uh, as, as she is. Um, and she's judged, and she's condemned, and she's sentenced. OK. Now, the novel by Mickey Splane called The Erection Set has been described as a modern version of The Count of Monte Cristo. And revenge is a prominent motif there and in others of Spillane's novels. Although, with Spillane, often the revenge is not directly on behalf of the person uh, doling it out, but on behalf of someone who's been victimized. Okay, friend of his, something that happened to a friend of his, and he's going to act on that basis. In uh, The Count of Monte Cristo, it's what happened to him himself. Okay, and here's another one. And this one is suggested by Max Allen Collins. It's a Dumas connection. I think it might be a Dumas connection and maybe somebody else that I'll tell you about in a minute. And I'm going to read you from the beginning of My Gun is Quick, which was uh, the second My Camera novel published, and read you a little bit, OK? When you sit at home, comfortably folded up in a chair beside a fire, have you ever thought what goes on outside there? Probably not. You pick up a book and read about things, getting a vicarious kick from people and events that never happened. You're doing it now, getting ready to fill a normal life with the details of someone else's experiences. Fun, isn't it? You read about life on the outside, thinking of maybe how you'd like it to happen to you, or at least how you'd like to watch it. And then, you know, he differentiates between what it's like to be reading about it versus living it in the city. And he says, that's my business. That's what I do. Well, Max Allen Collins thought that this was a little like the opening of the novel Georges by Dumas. It was published a little bit before The Count of Monte Cristo and has some of its motifs. Again, I'm going to read you a little bit from a translation. Has it never been your fate on one of those long, cold, gloomy winter evenings when alone with your own thoughts, you stood listening to the wind as it howled down the corridors and the rain as it, and the rain as it beat at your window, your brow resting against the mantelpiece and your eyes glazing without seeing them at the, leg, at the legs crackling on the logs, sorry, crackling on the hearth, and then, you know, again, the differentiation between what it's like to be outside and for adventure to be happening there versus here. Now, Mickey Splane said that he never read that novel. However, he also said that he read everything by Dumas and that he wished he'd written more. Well, maybe he read it, maybe he didn't. But I think that that's an attention-grabbing opening 
you know, the direct appeal to the reader. And whether he got it from Dumas, got it on his own, or whether it was something that he liked and read somewhere else, I think that we can see that it's the sort of thing that would appeal to him. And I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. Okay, first I want to tell you about Anthony Hope. Okay, Anthony Hope. Mickey Splane used to say that every year he reread The Prisoner of Zenda. He said it was the most memorable book from his childhood, and it's a good book. 1894, it's a British novel set in a fictional European country, and in it, a king on the eve of his coronation is drugged by his evil brother, Michael, in order to keep, but in order to keep the coronation on schedule, they recruit a visiting Englishman who looks a lot like the king to, be, to pretend to be the king. And so he's pretending to be the king, and the next thing you know, he keeps up the impersonation, he's got to be a hero, he's got to fend off the evildoers, he's got to rescue the true king, he's got to show physical courage and moral courage, they try to bribe him, and he falls in love, rises in love with a woman in the case. It was turned to a film, if that sounds familiar to you, 1937, directed by John Cromwell, with Ronald Coleman in the double role of the king and the Englishman, and his enemy, the evil Michael, is played by Raymond Massey, whom we know later on from The Fountainhead. If this sounds familiar about the impersonator who continues to play a role, you've seen other versions of this story. One of my favorites is Robert Heinlein's Double Star. But the interesting, one interesting thing to me is that Mickey Spillane did one too. He wrote a story called The Duke Alexander in which there's uh, a Joe from the garage who looks like someone who is a duke. And you know it's like Prisoner of Zenda that uh, he's got to run, he doesn't become a full-fledged hero, but he's got to rise to the occasion. There's a certain amount of comic surprise. Why are people treating me this way when it's not my life? And then at the end, things work out well for him. It was originally an idea for a possible film, but the film didn't get made, but the story exists. In other words, Anthony Hope, this book that he reread every year, he found a way to play with doing that. Now I'm going to tell you about Frederick Brown, and then that'll take us to Ayn Rand, and then we can have some questions. Frederick Brown. Mickey Spillane said that Frederick Brown was, quote, my favorite author of all time, unquote. Okay? My favorite author of all time. And he also said that Frederick Brown was the writer of his favorite lines. He said the most meaningful lines in literature were the opening of a story. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock on the door. Okay. That story called Knock, and it's played with, and that's uh, by Frederick Brown. And also, Mickey Splane included a Frederick Brown story in an anthology called A Century of Noir, 32 Classic Crime Stories, which he co-edited with Max. And that story starts like this. You got to, this sounds like the Duma also, but it also sounds like my gun is quick. And it's a good story. But I'm just gonna, not going to tell you how it works. I'm just going to read you the opening. Just sit back and relax now. Try to enjoy this. It's going to be the last story you ever read, or nearly the last. After you finish it, you can sit there and stall a while. You can find excuses to hang around your house or your room or your office, wherever you're reading this. But sooner or later, you're going to have to get up and go out. That's where I'm waiting for you, outside, or maybe closer than that, maybe in this room. Now, if you can stop reading after that, well, I don't know. I, I, think, I think that's a classic opening, and, um, and that was certainly something that Mickey Splane enjoyed. And as you see, he did something like that himself. OK, now, to take it back to Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand was also an admirer of Frederick Brown, as you probably know. In the Objectivist calendar, she wrote, when one talks about ingenuity, one cannot admit Frederick Brown, who is brilliant in that respect. And she praised as his wittiest and most startling book, the collection of short stories entitled Nightmares and Giesenstacks. So, Mickey Splane, Ayn Rand, both fans of Frederick Brown. And now, since it's Mickey Splane's Miami and more, I'm going to tell you a little more about the two of them. OK, I'm going to tell you about the publisher they had in common. And I, I'll tell you a little bit, and I can tell you more if you want to ask. 
because I, I got very, I, I, I really didn't know much about Victor Waybright, but I learned more about him over the past year. He was mentioned in the biography, and then I followed up by reading his own memoir. He was the co-founder of New American Library, okay, and he was really important to both Mickey Spillane and to Ayn Rand because Mickey Spillane did not have an easy start. He became one of the best-selling authors of all time, but his first book was being published by Dutton, and it was going nowhere. They didn't even want to publish it. The way that I, the jury, got published to begin with was that uh, someone, McKenna, had brought it to their attention who would help them out with cardboard for publishing their children's books. You can't make this stuff up, right? Someone helps them with the children's books, and the next thing you know, they're publishing the Keys for Lane. But they, they published I, the Jury. It's not selling. And Victor Waybright read it, and he said, this is a really fine book. And he negotiated for the paperback rights. He got, went to the phone, and, and um, John Edmondson, who was handling the subsidiary rights, said, $2,000 will take it. And Victor Waybright says, who in the devil ever heard of Mickey Spillane? Which at that time was true. And what about $500? And the guy said, uh, $1,500. And he said, $750, and that was it. You've got the book. He had the book, and then he met Mickey, and the two of them made a plan that they're going to sell millions of copies, and it worked out. Now, they did have a little trouble with the critics, and it looked as if they might be starting to have trouble with the censors. So what Waybright did is first he started telling the story, it was a true story, that Mickey Splane was being taught in college at William and Mary, but nobody cared about that. They said they did crazy things in college. So the next thing he did is he found a literary critic, Charles Rollo, and said, write a, an article that'll make Mickey Spillane look respectable. And this was an article called Simonon and Spillane, The Metaphysics of Murder for the Millions. It was published in 1952. And I'm just gonna read you a little bit of this. Um, by his personality, his deeds, his methods, the hero bears witness to a secular credo for a religious doctrine. He may, like Maigret, believe that understanding is the highest good and that its fruit is compassion. He may, like Hammer, that's Mike Hammer, be the vessel of wrath which executes Jehovah's vengeance on those who committed iniquity. For the detective story, paradise is always regained and this is not all. The hero's spirit lays its hands upon the reader. Whatever system of belief the hero acts out will, for the duration, infuse something of itself into the reader. He waxes savage with hammer and rejoices as the wicked become the dead. OK, there was more to it. But this, this really worked, OK? This was now you know, respectability. And not only did it work to disarm the possible censors, although some critics never moderated their criticism, but also helped with getting other writers to understand that in signing a contract with Waybright, they were not putting themselves in bad company. Okay, so it was a good thing. So, one more thing, since it's Ayn Rand. Um, there was a, used to be a 25 cent barrier for paperbacks. Nobody wanted to pay more than 25 cents, and he says they'll pay more. So he made it 50 cents, people bought that, and then he broke the 75 cent barrier. And you know what that was. They called it a triple book, right? The Fountainhead? Okay, that, that's what broke the 75 cent barrier for paperbacks. And I think that's one of the reasons he says that um, Ayn Rand knew that he would respect her work, he wouldn't abridge it, and NAL became her regular publisher. Okay. Um, I talked last time about Mickey Splane and Ayn Rand. This time I, I put on the back of the handout some references, which you can follow up on. But for today, I thought that I would um, just tell you briefly that in the book that he wrote after he met Ayn Rand, he used the expression prime mover twice. He didn't use it in exactly the way that she used it. But nonetheless, I'm not used to seeing prime mover in crime fiction. And I think that it's probably not an accident. So I can stop now, and I can take a few questions, and right, which I ought to do. We only have five minutes. Right, I know. But um, well, I wanted to see some of the stuff is so unfamiliar that I thought I should tell you about it, and I will tell it. I will have. I will take. You got a question for me? Mm -hmm. 
And I got a question. Okay. Yes. So how about, let's talk about revenge for a moment. Okay. So if I'm right, Ayn Rand criticized the Count of Monte Cristo because of the use of revenge, yet that doesn't seem to be the case for its use in Mickey Splain. Do you have any comments on that difference? Sure, okay. Well, I, I think that um, what, what Ayn Rand said is that in the Count of Monte Cristo, she found it disappointing that all the plotting degenerated into revenge, and I think uh, possibly part of that is that Dumas' Count of Monte Cristo is also unscrupulous, you know, like he goes after the sun. I mean, that's not fair. Uh, I think that in the case of Mickey Spillane, what he's, um, for one thing, uh, he is often uh, remedying something that cannot, he's bringing justice home in a way that it can't be brought home in any other way. The police have already tried, so that's the thing. He knows how the police work, and that's been tried, and he's got to find another way. Now, I think you could say that she would say, don't try this at home, and that um, Mickey Spillane's characters are not in all respects the way you'd want to live. But the thing about the Count is that he spends years and years and years, and it's sort of as if that's his full-time job. And with um, Mike Hammer, it's not his, he's not Mr. Revenge. It's not his full-time job, it's just, you know, it's, it's in his hands, he sees it, nothing's being done about it. He's gonna have to do something about it. You know, it's the task that came to him. So I think that's the difference. I'm not speaking for myself, actually. I'm speaking for, mostly for, for Mickey Spillane and for what she seems to have said about him. And if, as you know, she also said that she didn't entirely agree with his sense of life um, in the sense of being bitter. Okay. I kind of lost track. Um, how many books did Mickey Spillane write? Okay, well, he may have lost track too, but... Uh, <laughs> I think that um, he probably all told, um, I think there were 13 Mike Hammers, and then there were uh, at least as many other books, and then there are the books that he started and Max finished for him. But you can go on Amazon, I think you can still find them all, at least on Kindle or in paperback. Yeah, Google would just tell me how many he sold. 225, 225 million, million copies. Yeah. 225 million copies Thank sold, you. mostly of the first seven. Okay, and I've got one minute, so I'll tell you one more thing. Okay, when he was interviewed by Scott McConnell for 100 Voices of People Who Knew Ayn Rand, he commented with pleasure and with pride. She said she always enjoyed reading the work of Mickey Spillane because it was never gray. It was either black or white. And I think that you would have that same impression if you read Mickey Spillane yourself. So thanks for coming. <laughs>